On July 2, 1934, Crescent Lake Bible Camp opened its first season of Christian camps for young people. This camp was the dream of Arthur Perkins, a Presbyterian minister from Merrill, Wisconsin. Located at Crescent Lake near Rhinelander, Wisconsin, this was his dream of a camp that would be accessible and affordable to young people, but also of a camp that would preach the Word of God, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ from the scriptures without compromise. This camp was not without controversy. In fact, in 1935, charges were brought against Reverend Perkins for his involvement here at this camp. A trial was held, a conviction was secured, and a censure was brought against him. We are here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp for a conference examining the life and legacy of this remarkable servant of Jesus Christ. In our conference, there are seven lectures and four sermons written by Reverend Perkins, delivered by me, Reverend Brian DeYoung, the pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. This conference is the production of the archivist and historian of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Minnesota of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church done in conjunction with our good friends from WVCY-TV and with the help of the Crescent Lake board and staff. Well, welcome. My name is Brian DeYoung. I'm the pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I am also the archivist and historian of the Presbytery of Wisconsin and Minnesota of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And I'm welcoming you to the Arthur Perkins Conference. We are here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp on Crescent Lake near Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And we are going to be spending the week looking at the life and legacy of Art Perkins. So tonight we're going to just get to know him a little bit understand who this person is. Arthur Franklin Perkins was born on Tuesday, October 25, 1887 in Appleton, Wisconsin to J.S. Perkins and his second wife, Jenny. Arthur's father worked in real estate and he was a respected member of the community in Appleton. Jenny was an immigrant from England among the issues of the day in Appleton was the installation of the newfangled electric lighting invented by Thomas Edison. Art lived almost his whole life in the state of Wisconsin, and he died on December 29, 1936, at the Mendota State Mental Hospital in Madison. He was buried at the Hickory Cemetery near Hickory Corners, Wisconsin. Arthur was only 49 years old when he passed from this life to the next. The story of his life, and especially of the last five years of his life, is fascinating. Sometimes I am asked how I became interested in this man. Well, my involvement goes back to a meeting of our presbytery and at that presbytery meeting, there was a vacancy for the position of archivist. I was intrigued. I love church history. And so I brought up the vacancy to the presbytery and was immediately elected to fill the position. In my position as the archivist of our presbytery, I began examining the records of our early presbytery meetings. The minutes of the very first meeting of this presbytery caught my attention. On July 30, 1936, a meeting was convened of the new Presbytery of Wisconsin. The meeting was held in Merrill, Wisconsin, in the living room of Arthur Perkins. Not only was Reverend Perkins the convener of that meeting, but he was elected as the first moderator of the presbytery. Who was this man, I wondered. 
And that curiosity led me down a path of research and discovery with stops at the Merrill Historical Society, the Crescent Lake Bible Camp, the Bible Presbyterian Church in Merrill, the PCA Historical Center in St. Louis, the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia, the Machen Archive at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and the archive of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Now in my research, I have had the honor of getting to know two of Perkins' surviving descendants, his grandson, Bruce Nagler, and his granddaughter, Rosemary Hudson. I have been greatly helped as well by Mr. Don Williamson, who is the unofficial historian of the Crescent Lake Bible Camp and a longtime member of their board. We are very grateful for the willingness of the board and the staff at Crescent Lake to allow us to have our conference here in the chapel. In our first session, I want to introduce you to this remarkable man, Arthur Perkins. I will tell you something about his early life, about his spiritual conversion, about his training and preparation for the Christian ministry. And that will take us up to March 1, 1927, when he was called to be the field director for the Winnebago Presbytery. The family tree of Arthur Perkins extends back to Puritan England in the 1620s. King James I of England fought against the Puritans in Parliament for control of both the nation and the church. His son and successor, King Charles I, continued his father's policies, provoking many to leave for America in what was called the Great Migration. On December 1st, 1630, John Perkins Sr. took his wife, Judith, and their five children aboard a ship named Lyon. Among their shipmates was the Reverend Roger Williams. They made the difficult wintertime journey through the North Atlantic, arriving in Massachusetts Bay on February 5. There, John and Judith took up residence and quickly joined the church. They became a fruitful and successful New England Puritan family with many descendants and much property. Some of those descendants moved westward, first to Canada, later to Wisconsin. Arthur's grandfather, Lyman Perkins, was an old and respected resident of Carleton, Wisconsin, a city east of Green Bay near Kewanee. Lyman's son, Jared Seymour, J.S. Perkins, married a woman and had several children by her before she died. He married again, this time to the English lady, Sarah Jane Trevor, who liked to be called Jenny. J.S. and Jenny had three children, Arthur, a younger brother, Ray Bruce, who died at 16 months of age, and a daughter named Elnora. Now, as I mentioned, Art spent his early years in Appleton. The family is listed in the census of 1900 as living in Appleton, but shortly after that, they relocated to Maple Valley near the towns of Surring and Hickory Corners. J.S. went back to farming with the help of a teenage Arthur. And according to grandson Bruce Nagler, by age 17, Art owned and operated two farms. Now, during these years of agriculture, he developed a reputation as a leader among his fellow farmers, and he held important posts in local agricultural organizations. On April 13, 1910, Art married Miss Marie Hero of Coleman, Wisconsin. Marie had descended from French stock. She was both lovely and faithful. 
Soon after, they had their first child, son Dale Hero Perkins. And later, three girls were born, Ramona, Doris, and Joy. Arthur and Marie also had a miscarriage in 1928, and apparently it was another daughter. The turning point for Art came in 1915, when he attended an evangelistic meeting at the Methodist Church near Hickory Corners. That night, the Lord Jesus Christ called Art Perkins out of spiritual darkness and into his light. His heart changed. Art put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He had been soundly converted, and he was a new man in Christ Jesus. Soon afterwards, Art began sensing a call to preach the gospel. His good friend, Ernest Tremblay, tells the story in a tribute written after Art's death. Tremblay writes, Mr. Perkins was a saved man. He had actually and experimentally received the Lord Jesus as his Savior and was trusting in nothing less than the finished work of Christ. A regenerated and reconciled man, he knew he was saved and kept saved by nothing but the grace of God. As such, he was a witness for his master and had a testimony that could not be silenced. Mr. Perkins was a winner of souls. There will be many stars in his crown. Called by God from behind the plow, he never lost sight of his calling as being that of winning souls. He was evangelical and evangelistic and a fire with zeal and enthusiasm for the salvation of the lost. He was a fisher of men in season and out of season. In spite of much professionalism in the ministry, social gospel in many pulpits, and endless schemes of men in the church to reform a lost and hopeless world, my friend kept on doing the work of an evangelist in pointing all men to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Quite a testimony. In 1917, the world was at war, and men were being drafted to serve their country. Arthur filed for an exemption from the draft, stating that he had family to support. That exemption was granted by the government, and he took his young family to Chicago in order to attend the Moody Bible Institute. Now, apparently, Art had a high school diploma, but he did not have any background in college studies. Moody accepted men into their program without college experience and trained them to be soul winners. One of the great emphases in their curriculum was on evangelism, both personal evangelism and group evangelism. While continuing his studies, Perkins served as a pastoral intern at Methodist churches in Oconto and Spencer, Wisconsin. Now, somewhere along the way, Art Perkins became a convinced Presbyterian. He was not just kind of loosely Presbyterian. He was rock solid in his commitment to Presbyterianism. So in 1921, in September, the Winnebago Presbytery of the Presbyterian Church of the USA received Art Perkins under their care. A year later, on September 12, 1922, he was examined and ordained for the gospel ministry in that presbytery. And during the years of 1920 through 22, he served time as the associate pastor of the PCUSA Church in Wausau, where he made many friends. Late in 1922, 
Perkins was called to North Milwaukee Presbyterian Church. He was also called to serve another Presbyterian church in the North Milwaukee area. It was a smaller church that often piggybacked on the ministers of other churches. So he was actually called to two churches. And so late in 1922, he was installed at these churches where he preached and ministered for almost four years. When he arrived in Milwaukee, the churches he served were lethargic. His evangelistic zeal and his love for children and young people energized the church. During his time of service there, a steady stream of new members were received into those congregations. In the Moody Alumni Bulletin, he wrote about his time in North Milwaukee. He said, I have just closed a pastorate in North Milwaukee Presbyterian Church. I was with them three years and nine months. During that time, 89 were received into the church, most of them on confession of faith. He was an evangelist. He was always calling men to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now his ministry to young people included a young man by the name of Leslie Dunn. Dunn would become a minister of the gospel and serve in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church for 44 years. Dunn wrote a tribute to Perkins, which was published in the Christian Beacon magazine after Perkins' death. He says, one who has for many years taken an uncompromising stand for the truths of the gospel has gone to his reward. The Reverend Arthur F. Perkins, who was born on this day, did not enter the ministry until he was almost 30 years of age. Following conversion, he immediately gave up his former occupation and entered Christian service, witnessing to the saving and keeping power of the Lord Jesus Christ in out-of-the-way places in central Wisconsin, where many found Jesus Christ as personal Savior through his tireless efforts. With a strong faith in God, he took his family and entered the Moody Bible Institute, where he found more outlets for his enthusiasm for the Lord. While a student there, he served a church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was while he was minister of that church during his student days at Moody that several young folks, among whom I was one, and older ones too, found Jesus Christ as Savior. Again, what a testimony to a tireless evangelist. Recently, I was talking to a friend of mine who was interested in my research of Reverend Perkins. And my friend asked me a simple but important question. What kind of man was he? Well, Arthur Perkins was a large man. He was tall by standards of his time. He was physically imposing. Like many men in their 40s, he was a bit overweight, not, not obese, but he was not thin either. Carrie Fenton describes him in her book, A Costly Dream. She says, he was tall, dark, and heavy with a blue chin. Later, I found out he shaved twice a day and an outgoing personality. As he talked, his hands moved in strong gestures. Now, from the pictures that I have seen, it seems that he had a full head of dark hair right up to the time of his death. Carrie's husband, Kay Fenton, describes Perkins as follows. Mr. Perkins is a strong, healthy man, full of vigor and constantly active. I don't know a thing he can't do. Kay Fenton went on to describe what a good cook Arthur was. 
He's a good cook. I found that out. What did he feed you? Well, for breakfast, he made light, tasty pancakes served with whatever we brought, sausage, eggs, bacon, or ham. He didn't drink coffee himself, but he made it for us. Then he filled gallon fruit cans with it to heat over a campfire at the building site. I never saw a chef slap sandwiches together any faster. He made them in the morning for us to eat at noon. Never wasted a minute. What did you have for supper? Mostly what was brought in, meat, potatoes, and vegetables, no salads. I was glad I had your home canned chicken, beef, and vegetables, and fruit for my share. But the most surprising thing, his dessert. Cottage cheese tort. Delicious. He drank lots of buttermilk, and I enjoyed some of it with him. Did he serve fish? Oh, he sure did. Sometimes when we men woke up, he would be coming in with enough for supper. Then we would clean them while he got breakfast. He was an early riser. Joanne Stevenson Gutenach was a child when she knew Arthur Perkins. She described his preaching style, boisterous. He was boisterous and he wasn't hard to listen to. He got your attention. Carrie Fenton describes a week at camp when Perkins was the speaker. Mr. Perkins was the evening speaker for the week. The campers had to sit on the benches by the tables, some with elbows on them and some with backs against them. Discomfort? Not with Mr. Perkins speaking. The campers sat enthralled. Carrie Fenton later said, I laughed thinking of some of his funny gestures. He's so full of life. I wasn't surprised at how the boys hung on his words. Another aspect of his personality is that he took charge whenever he was in the room. His enemies recognized and resented this and they even acknowledged it in his trial. In reading various reports of meetings and events, it appears that Arthur Perkins had a commanding presence. He knew how to lead and he exercised leadership instinctively. People looked to him for leadership and he did not disappoint them. He was also spiritually oriented, a truly pious person. Carrie Fenton describes this. She says, everyday life did not seem to dim Mr. Perkins' thoughts of God and the Bible, and he sometimes surprised people with sudden emergence of these thoughts into conversation. One instance of this was evidenced when he was a guest at our home as a speaker in the Crivets Church. As I was preparing breakfast, he came from the guest room crossed the dining room and kitchen on his way to Kay's study. He could have said a usual good morning, but he impressed me with another greeting. Mrs. Fenton, when Jesus forgave a woman taken in adultery, did he condemn her? I like that kind of unexpected question and quickly replied, no. He said, neither do I condemn thee, go thy way and sin no more. He laughed. You have two words too many. I was so sure that those were the words that I was surprised and looked my question. He went on. When Jesus forgives us, Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He doesn't want us to walk in the same way after the flesh, but in his way after the spirit. Oh, now I know. He said, go and sin no more. I should leave out thy way. I'll never forget that again. Many times since I have thought of Mr. Perkins' Bible-oriented talk and wished that I had that gift. His spirituality was not put on 
to impress people. It was not a facade. It went deep into his soul. Yet another quality that is important, this man loved children and young people. From his very earliest days in ministry, he never neglected the young. He was always concerned for the little ones of Christ's kingdom. His own daughter, Joy, beautifully testifies to this quality in her father. She says, my dad was young when he died. I was 14, the youngest of his children. As I think back to those few years with him, given to me by my maker, I realize that to me, daddy made God very real as a heavenly father because I had a compassionate and loving earthly father. Sometimes when he would be working on his sermon, he would call me in from my play only to give me a hug and a kiss. Was he preparing one of his children's sermons? Did he need a child, his own child, to express their mutual love in order to be able to tell the children of God's love for them? When I was very little, he often took me with him on his pastoral calls, for he seemed to love to have me near. My dad was an evangelist. He wanted men and women, boys and girls, to accept the Savior he loved. He preached to them and invited them to come to the one who said, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. And he knew that Christ said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. He had a tender heart towards children and young people. And then he was also a generous and kind man. He was always willing to help in any way that he could. Sometimes he would le lend out his cabin here at Crescent Lake to a poor pastor who had nowhere to go for vacation. He loved to share the good things that God had given to him. So as I close, let me read a few more excerpts from the memorial by Ernest Tremblay, which was later published by the Crescent Lake Bible Fellowship. My friend Arthur F. Perkins was a man of high and noble character. Though being a power of personality and leadership, nevertheless, he was conscious of his shortcomings and weaknesses, humble before God, and felt his absolute dependence upon him as few men do. Mr. Perkins was a prophet in his day, a preacher of righteousness. He boldly and fearlessly declared the whole counsel of God to all men at all times. He pointed out, denounced, and condemned sin in high and low places. He contended for the faith once delivered unto the saints. He had a prophetic vision and in no uncertain terms could say, Thus saith the Lord. He honored and exalted righteousness and pointed all men to a consecrated, consistent Christian living. Mr. Perkins was a friend of children and young people. Both as a pastor and as a field man, he was ahead of his generation in successful work among them. He organized youth as few men can, and hundreds of them can testify to the spiritual blessings received under his ministry or due to his leadership. He knew how to meet their needs both socially and spiritually and led many to Christ and Christian service. It was his great love for youth that inspired and urged him in the establishment of the Crescent Lake Bible Camp. The writer, being one in heart with him in the enterprise, knows as no man does how sincere, pure, unselfish, highly spiritual, and missionary were Mr. Perkins' motives in launching that project. Mr. Perkins was a man ever willing to pay the price. He paid it for success in his work. 
Perkins was successful, as few men are, in the pastorate, and possibly more so in the field director's work. This was due partly to his natural ability, inherited talents, then in a very great measure, it was due to his paying the price for success. Sundays and weekdays, night and day, in season and out of season, Perkins was at his work. He put himself in it, body, soul, spirit, talents, and pocketbook. You get what you put in, was his slogan, and it worked. He did not hold a job. He had a task and accomplished things because he put himself, all he was and all he had, on the altar. He was also willing to pay the price for principle and convictions. Determine what is right first and then do it was his life sacred motto, and he lived by it and he died by it. Mr. Perkins would not compromise when anything wrong was involved. Convictions established and supported by God's word always decided him for what course he should take. The policy of right or wrong obey found no response in his heart and mind. Rather, he studied to have a good conscience before God every day. That he satisfied, resting upon God's infallible word. Mr. Perkins was true to his friends, honoring them that honored him. He would go to the limit to support and defend them. He had hosts of them among the young and the old, the, among the rich and the poor. A good word spoken on his behalf or a good deed done to him was never forgotten. He lived in the spirit of the master of whom it was said, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. And his friends responded to his affection. Mr. Perkins was a man of prayer. He prayed without ceasing, at all times, everywhere, under all circumstances. He prayed for his friends and with tears for his foes. Labors, plans, problems, difficulties, everything was taken to the Lord in prayer. And God did for him exceedingly abundantly above all that he asked or thought. The prayer services he conducted and established among Christian workers were real seasons of refreshing from above. And the writer will treasure till we meet again the sacred and sweet memory of fellowship in prayer when two hearts beat like one and come boldly to the throne of grace to be helped in time of need. Like the Apostle Paul, he sealed many of his partings with blessings from above, come down in response to tearful praying in the Spirit. This faithful man, this minister of the gospel, this preacher of Jesus Christ and him crucified, this warrior from the truth, this was Arthur Perkins. In our next lecture, we are going to look at his work as the field director of the Winnebago Presbytery of the PCUSA. Well, thank you for your attention to this video and this conference. I trust that it has been of spiritual encouragement and help to you, and that it has given you some historical data that you were not aware of. There will be a biography of Arthur Perkins forthcoming. The title is Standing Against Tyranny, The Life and Legacy of Arthur Perkins. I am the author, and it will be published through Amazon.com. Lord willing, we will also have an audiobook available for that. For information, please contact me, Brian DeYoung, at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church, 4930 Green Valley Lane, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, 53083. Thank you.